Hello, I'm Peter Afrasiabi. I'm an intellectual property lawyer and a partner at One LLP. We are a small intellectual property litigation and patent prosecution boutique in Southern California. We have offices in LA and Orange County, and our focus is copyright, trademark, and patents. Today's program is fair use, from Star Trek to Prince, and the fun part is you get to vote on a fair use question about U2 and their music. So this program is for you, the generalist. It's not only for intellectual property lawyers. It's not only for copyright lawyers. It's really geared and designed to give you, as a general lawyer, maybe you're a transactional lawyer or you're a civil litigator and you counsel general clients on general questions, I want to give you a real understanding and idea of fair use and what it is. Fair use, of course, is a phrase that's kicked around in society all the time. And you hear people all the time saying that their use of someone else's work was fair and legal under fair use principles. That is a question that's interesting, and that's a question we're going to look at today as we walk through fair use. Now, of course, we're going to do it in a fun way because we're going to look at fun pop culture examples from, you know, Star Trek and Dr. Seuss to Green Day to Prince and a whole bunch of other things in between. So buckle up, get your popcorn because we're going Hollywood on this one and let's get going. Today's program, we're going to do a quick overview of copyright because in order to understand fair use, which is an affirmative defense to a copyright infringement claim, we want to have a little bit of an understanding of copyright infringement. So I'm going to give you a quick refresher on what copyrights are and what a copyright infringement question posits so that we can then talk about whether the use of someone else's work is a fair one. We're going to look at the four factors that constitute the fair use analysis and inquiry. And we're going to then look at various case law. We're going to look at examples of how those four factors play out across a whole range of famous different media examples. We're going to see Star Trek and Gone with the Wind. We're going to see Dr. Seuss and Catcher in the Rye. On the music space, we're going to see, of course, the two live crew, Green Day, Elvis, and again, a little bit of U2. We're going to talk about parody and satire, and we're going to look at Don Henley's Boys of Summer and an upstart Republican Senate candidate who um, took on Don Henley's um, Boys of Summer and made his own song. And spoiler alert, yours truly was one of the lawyers that litigated that case for the upstart Republican Senate candidate when Don Henley sued our client. And of course, we're going to look at fan fiction, this fun little corner of the universe where fans create their own new works based upon existing literary universes and publish them and post them on the internet often. And questions then arise, of course, about whether those works are infringements or fair uses. Now, of course, in this CLE, as you learn about the law, I'm going to give you some tips for advising clients who then posit questions to you about, can I do this? Can I not do that? Is it a fair use? Have I taken too much or too little? How much is too much? How much is too little? Those types of questions that revolve around the borrowing of other people's works. And of course, as I told you, the really fun new thing we're doing in this program today is the interactive aspect of it. At the very end of it, I'm going to give you a website link after I give you the hypothetical so that you can go and vote on whether a use by you 2 in one of their songs of a line from a short story, whether you think it's a fair use or whether you think Bono and company infringed. And that's a fun one for you. So we'll, we'll do that at the end because that's the funnest part of it, today's program. Let's frame the problem now and get started in terms of copyright law and fair use and where it comes from. The starting point, of course, for us here in our, in our republic is the Copyright Clause of the Constitution. And Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 says that the copyright, this is what's known as the Copyright Clause, it is to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Now, there is no textual provision for fair use expressly in the Constitution or at the Republic's founding. There was nothing in, the, in the, an act of Congress um, you know, of talking about fair use either. It was entirely a part of the common law, and it was part of the common law heritage that came over from England. And here we have an early case from Massachusetts in 1841. This is Justice Story. Um, it's, report, it's called Folsom v. Marsh, 9, Federal Case 342. It's from 1841. And here you have a quote. And the quote from Justice Story is, look to the nature and objects of the selections made, the quantity and value of the materials used, and the degree in which the use may prejudice the sale or diminish the profits or supersede the objects of the original work. So you can see there, that's a very early 
articulation of this idea of fair use, this idea of mediating the line between protecting someone's monopoly in their creation on the one hand and allowing other people to borrow from works, to develop new works for a society, to, going back to the Constitution, promote the progress of science and useful arts. Here's another quote from Justice Story. This is our penultimate bullet point. It's Emerson versus Davies, 8 Federal Case 615. This is from Massachusetts in 1845. And here Justice Story talked about fair use, copyright infringement questions, and that line that we talk about mediating the line between infringing versus fair use in these terms. In truth, in literature, in science, and in art, there are and can be few, if any, things which in an abstract sense are strictly new and original throughout. Every book in literature, science and art, borrows and must necessarily borrow and use much which was well known and used before. So the question this raises then, and the question that's always raised is, the nature of creative efforts requires borrowing and building upon the historical stock of existing content, tropes, ideas, settings, characters, knowledge, and adapting from those prior works to create new works. And so the question is, how much is too much? How do we, on the one hand, navigate this tension between providing the monopoly that we provide to a copyright owner, the right to control their work? George Lucas created Star Wars. He sold it to Disney. Disney now owns Star Wars. They are the exclusive right holders to the Star Wars universe and the characters. How do we mediate the line between protecting Disney's right to control and patrol that monopoly and not allow people to infringe and also allow other people to create new works that may build upon or tangent the Star Wars universe in a way lawfully or in a way that are not lawful, right? That is the root question that we get to when we're talking about copyright and particularly fair use. Let's talk really quick about the history of fair use. As noted, for two centuries in our republic, it was a judge-made doctrine. I mean, it was literally a common law doctrine that was imported from England at the founding of, of our country. And it became part of the, what you could call federal common law. It was just a judicially made doctrine. We saw some of those quotes from Justice Story that courts would apply and use to discern this line between infringement and you know, acceptable use of another's work. Now finally, in the Copyright Act of 1976, which was enacted on January 1st, 1978, but because it was passed in 1976, it's known as the Copyright Act of 76. In the 1976 Act, Congress finally codified as positive statutory law fair use. And here we have in 17 U.S.C. section 107 the core language that now decides all of our fair use questions. In determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, the factors to be considered shall include, number one, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes, number two, the nature of the copyrighted work, Number three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And number four, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So those are the four factors that had been distilled over the common law history of copyright law in America and were then codified. And so nowadays when we talk about fair use and the fair use analysis, we are always talking about what is you know, often referred to as this four-factor test. Let's talk quickly first about some basic principles though about copyright just to remind you. Fair use is an affirmative defense to a copyright infringement claim. And so remember, what that means from our civil procedure is that if you have been found to infringe so that you have in fact infringed someone's copyright, you can have a get out of jail free card if you can pull out an affirmative defense because an affirmative de defense posits that yes I may be liable under the law but it doesn't matter for this reason such as statute of limitations, latches, whatnot. but here fair use. And so it's an affirmative defense which makes it very important for us to revisit really quick 
a substantive overview of copyright at the highest level just so you can properly contextualize fair use. So let's do a quick copyright review for you. Copyright gives the author of an original expressive work certain exclusive rights with respect to that work. And that author has the following exclusive rights under the U.S. Copyright Act. This is section 106. The exclusive right to reproduce, that means to make copies of a work. The exclusive right to reproduce. Number two, the exclusive right to make derivatives. What that means is to adapt, create new versions of that original work. So think Star Wars. George Lucas made Star Wars. He had, he owned the copyright, which means he had the exclusive right to make reproductions of the movie, you know, make DVD copies or, you know, make new 35 millimeter literal copies to deliver the movie houses to play. But he also had the right to make derivatives, which is to then make sequels, The Empire Strikes Back and then, you know, the 20 odd sequels that have been made since then. Copyright also gives the author of an original work the exclusive right to publicly distribute copies of that work. It has a public performance right for songs and movies and plays as an exclusive right of the, of the original author of that work to do a public performance of the work. Number fifth, public display right. And number six, for sound recordings, there's a public performance right to you know, perform publicly those sound recordings. If you violate any of those exclusive rights, that is an act of copyright infringement. And so the basic question that comes up most often is that first one, the, the reproduction right. Have you, or the derivative right, have you reproduced someone's work in a manner that is not fair use and so infringes copyright? And the test is always one that's known as substantial similarity. And so if you make a literal copy of Star Wars, obviously it's substantially similar to the original. And so that's a violation of the reproduction right. If you take snippets of it out, and put them into some whole other work that you've made, the question raised would be whether that new work you've made that may have a few snippets of Star Wars um, is substantially similar to the original one. And if you take the snippets lock, stock, and barrel, it's probably going to be a problem for you. Now, tripping the line, though, of copyright infringement is what gets us to this question of fair use. You know, when is it acceptable or okay under our societal copyright norms to borrow from someone else and use their work to create your own new work where you recognize that yes I took from that work but it's an acceptable use because I am myself now engaged in something different that's not copyright infringement. It's lawful borrowing in effect is what we're talking about. And so now there's again our slide of the four fair use factors if you just keep them in mind because we're going to go through all of them in detail now. So let's talk about on our next slide Fair use factor number one, the purpose and character of the use. So, as you see from the statutory language, I mean, nonprofit educational purposes are generally favored over commercial uses. And so there's a kind of a spectrum. If you are engaged in a commercial endeavor using someone else's work, it's more likely that that first factor is going to put you into the non fair use camp. If you're further down the spectrum in sort of nonprofit educational uses, it's more likely that you, that first factor at least, will get you into the fair use camp. Now, there are many purposes that are especially appropriate for a fair use finding when you're looking at the purpose, purpose and character of the defendant's use, this new work's use. And the types of things that find refuge in fair use findings are criticisms, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship research. Now, here's the point though, and this is a first practice pointer. There are no bright line rules really when it comes to fair use, and this is why it's so difficult for you advising clients, because even a nonprofit, you know, a perceived nonprofit educational use by a professor of materials can actually sometimes not be found to be a fair use, um, you know, result. And so there's been a whole history of what are known as course pack cases, for example, where um, publishers sued schools and universities and even the faculty for putting together course packets, you know, where they would take a photocopy of a chapter from this book, you know, maybe this short story here and some other material from there, compile it into a course pack and then the students buy the course pack. Um, and there's, you know, famous cases all over the country. One of the famous ones involved NYU where NYU and faculty were sued 
and they ultimately settled and agreed to follow certain specific guidelines in terms of what they would and wouldn't copy in the future. And these were sort of strict limits in terms of words and pages and the like. And so what that shows, and there are other cases that are, that are established where universities have not been given a fair use you know, blank check. So it's no blank check even if you're in the educational realm. And that is one of the first markers of the difficult sort of world we're in here when we're talking about cop um, um, fair use. <clears throat> now, ultimately within this first factor, the central inquiry that courts always look at is what's known as transformative. Is the use that you've made of someone else's work transformative? And what that means is you're not merely reproducing something. Um, you are transforming it into something new, where there's new utility, new meaning, where maybe you have a quotation incorporated into a paper or it's commentary or criticism of the original. And so the types of things courts look for to figure out <clears throat> if a use is transformative is whether it furthers the purpose or different character in the defendant's work, i.e., the creation of new information, new aesthetics, new insights, new understandings. Whether there's genuinely new expression or meaning or message from the original work into the new work so that there's massive additional value that's being used in this new creation as opposed to just taking the old and making a few tweaks to it, for example. You know, the question of whether quoted material is being simply used as raw material or building blocks to build something genuinely new, or are you just repackaging someone's work in some new, new and different way, but really it's just a repackaging of the same thing? That's the first factor. So let's go to the second factor, which is the nature of the copyrighted work. And the inquiry here fundamentally is looking at the plaintiff's creative work. What's the nature of their work that's being borrowed from? And this then puts, on, puts us on the spectrum between is the plaintiff's work, the, the work that's being borrowed or copied from, is it a highly creative work at one end of the spectrum, such as you know, a, a piece of fiction, um, a book, a novel, a play, a poem, a movie, or is it more fact-based, sort of further down at the other end of the spectrum that has more limited copyright protection, such as you know, a, a history book giving you a bullet point history of the American Revolution, for example, has a thinner copyright than you know, a, a, a fictional account of just some murder mystery set in the American Re Revolution, obviously. Um, the other question that we look at here is, you know, is the work, the original work, unpublished or not? And if it's unpublished, then that weighs against any finding of fair use, because now the alleged fair use defender who wants to claim refuge in it has taken someone's unpublished work they haven't even had a chance to publish and has sort of made use of it publicly. And so fundamentally, the fundamental rule of thumb here is that when you're balancing this factor as you do your fair use analysis, courts tend to give greater protection to creative works. Um, and so, you know, the more creative the work, the more likely it is to not allow, the bar not allow borrowing and to not give someone a fair use finding. Let's go to the third factor, which is the amount or substantiality of the portion used. Now here what's, here's what's critical is that the law doesn't set quantity limits. I mean, it's generally true that the more you take, the less likely there is to be a fair use finding, but there is no sort of rule of thumb, and this is one of the urban legends out there that you often hear from, I hear it from non-lawyers, but I also even hear it from lawyers alike who are not copyright lawyers, that you know, some idea that oh, if I take less than 10%, it's per se fair use, and this is just not true. It's not a qualitative, and quantitative per se test, it's this balancing act and blending. And so while it's true the more you take, the more likely it's not fair use, it doesn't mean that if you only took a little, it's no big deal. Um, I mean, a great example to think of there is the famous case involving Gerald Ford's memoirs. Um, and his memoirs, you know, were to be published, and it was, you know, I don't know, 25,000 odd words. And, you know, the only words in the book that really mattered were the three or four hundred words where he explained why he pardoned President Nixon. And that's, you know, at root, that was all anyone really seemed to care about coming from Gerald Ford's biography, it seemed. And so, you know, when those words were taken and republished, the, the publisher sued and said, you know, you, know you, you took those words. And part of the defense posited was, we took, you know, 300 words out of 25,000 or whatever. I mean, it was like less than a fraction of a percent. And the court said, 
it's, it's not a quantitative analysis. It turns out you took the heart of the work. The only thing that really mattered was why the guy pardoned President Nixon, and that's what everyone wanted to know about, and so you took the heart of the work, and so you actually took everything that mattered. And so that's what shows you this sort of delicate balancing act there. Um, another example you can think of is that thumbnail images um, have been held to be you know, low-resolution thumbnail photographs in Google search engines have held to be a legitimate taking fair use use and so even though it's a reproduction when you do a Google search and someone else's photograph comes up Google has reproduced that photo to show it to you on your search it's a low res thumbnail image and the courts have said that because it's serving this search and indexing um, function um, that that use is a fair use so let's go to the fourth factor and that is the effect of the use on the potential market for the value of the work. And here it's a very complex analysis. The factor generally means that if you could have purchased or licensed the copyrighted work, that fact weighs against a finding of fair use because you are fundamentally, by taking the work and doing your own thing, you're impacting the market of the original. And effect here is also closely limited to purpose. I mean, if your purpose is research or scholarship, then a market effect may be difficult to prove. I mean, it may really just may be the case that you're doing some you know, research or scholarship and that doesn't impact the market for the original work that you're borrowing and writing up your research and scholarship. But if your purpose is commercial, then adverse market effects are much easier to prove. And so you know, what courts have generally held is that occasional quotations or photocopies in limited you know, amounts generally don't have an adverse market effect on the original. So, you know, for example, my PowerPoint presentation I'm giving you today, I have a copyright in it. If you reproduce the whole thing, it could be argued that it was infringement, assuming that there's even a copyright in this. Um, but if you just took one slide, it would be no big deal. Um, so go ahead and take a slide. Um, but in any event, if, if you copy the entirety of something, though, you run into problems. So that gets us through the, um, the fair use factors. And now we're going to start turning to our media. And we're going to turn immediately to the two live crew who went to the US Supreme Court in the early 1990s. So this case involved plaintiff um, you know, claiming that the song Pretty Woman um, was you know, infringing on the Oh Pretty Woman song by Roy Orbison I and mean, his famous rock ballad from the 1950s. And so the two live crew's version um, was similar in only one respect. The opening seven words were identical and the very early riff of the song musically was the same. And then the rest of the song departed. Um, you can see here the lyrics to the Two Life Crew version of Pretty Woman and it's only those first words, Pretty Woman walking down the street, that were the same as Roy Orbison's. And from there the two songs departed completely. And the Two Life Crew argued that the use of those words in the opening musical riff um, was a fair use because this was an exercise in parody and there you can see some of the lyrics and if you go to the actual opinion the Supreme Court put the lyrics side by side of both songs and you know what this one is an, is a parody but facially it appears to be a parody in terms of making fun of the original and the original about you know a pretty woman and this is a very different version of you know pretty woman um, and so it looked parodical in use but the lower courts said no 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 this is no fair use and part of what they said is that you know you could even you know touch upon the market for the original for for Roy Orbison's song and if you if you stop and think about that for a second that's quite a quite an idea the idea that someone would not listen to the Roy Orbison song because they would prefer to listen to the two live crews completely different like style of song and music as a market substitute is it seems to stretch credulity past the breaking point but nonetheless the case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court actually reversed and said this thing could be fair use and so here you see what the Supreme Court said is that it was error for the Court of Appeals to conclude that the commercial nature of two live crews parody rendered it presumptively unfair there is no such evidentiary presumption and so you have to look at this in its totality and so what the court ultimately held is that there, this could be a fair use, and so this matter had to go to trial to really get to the bottom in front of a jury as to whether it was a parody, and the fact that it was a commercial endeavor by the Two Life crew wasn't enough to simply say it's not fair use as a matter of law. So there can be commercial exploitations that can also be fair use. You just can't have a per se rule. And it was a very limited amount taken for parodical purposes, and that can make it okay. And then finally, the jury was left to task the question of is this a transformative sort of event that occurred did they take this existing idea of pretty woman and those lyrics 
which were set in a certain time period in America with a th certain ethos and feeling? And did they transform them into something that's fundamentally different and parodical, funny? Um, that's a question. And so that was then sent back to go to the jury. And so what you see then when, as the Supreme Court worked through it on their next slide, when they looked at factor one is that they said the new work did indeed add something new. It had a different purpose or a different character and it altered the first, the Roy Orbison version with new expression, with a new meaning, with new message. And that counsels in favor of a fair use finding. And so here's a key quote that the court relied on. And this quote actually comes from Judge Laval's formulation. And Judge um, Pierre Laval is a, is a very well-known judge on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals who um, first actually coined in, in the legal lexicon this idea of transformative purposes and has been sort of a, a large scholar of, of copyright jurisprudence. And so he's often cited to for fair use principles. And Judge Laval said, the use must be productive and must employ the quoted matter in a different manner or for a different purpose from the original. A quotation of copyrighted material that merely repackages or republishes the original is unlikely to pass the test. In Justice Story's words, it would merely supersede the objects of the original. If, on the other hand, the secondary use adds value to the original, if the quoted matter is used as raw material, transformed in the creation of new information or aesthetics, insights, and understandings, this is the very type of activity that the fair use doctrine intends to protect for the enrichment of society. So, from the two live crew, we're now going to boldly go where no one has gone before, and we're going to go into copying with Star Trek and Dr. Seuss. And so you see there on the left of this slide, on you know three images that come from the Ninth Circuit's 2020 um, decision involving Dr. Seuss and Star Trek and a battle between the two. And on the left of these pictures, you see the original Dr. Seuss works from their books. And on the right is the version that was made by some folks who took the Star Trek people and shoved them into the Dr. Seuss um, settings and imagery and storylines. Um, and the question then that got raised when Dr. Seuss Enterprises, who were not happy about this, sued um, the Star Trek folks who created the Star Trek version of Dr. Seuss, um, the question raised was, is this Star Trek mashup, is it fair use? Um, you know, is taking the Star Trek characters and putting them into the Dr. Seuss settings a new work? Or is it just simply repackaging the old and, and taking advantage of the old without really doing anything that's transformative? And so the new work was called Boldly, and the question I guess that the Ninth Circuit was going to ask is, were they bold enough or not? And ultimately what the Ninth Circuit said is, it wasn't bold enough. It was not transformative. It was commercial, and what the Ninth Circuit said <clears throat> is that there was nothing about the Star Trek version that was criticizing or commenting on Seuss and the Seuss work or the Seuss characters. Instead, it simply took the Seuss settings and backdrops and shoved in this, these Star Trek elements of you know, you know, Spock and um, you know, Captain Kirk and the like and substituted them into this Dr. Seuss world. And that doesn't create new meaning or understanding or insight or a message to the original. And so it wasn't transformative. In other words, what the court said is they simply recontextualized the original by plucking the most valuable parts of the original out and then in, you know, wrapping them around some other characters and then trying to claim, claim value in it. Now importantly, the Ninth Circuit also said this actually did cause, could cause market harm because a non-transformative commercial use po possibly leads to market harm. The court said it didn't have a presumption, but the language seems to create a bit of a presumption. Um, and part of what the Ninth Circuit said is that the original author's right to create derivative works, right? You remember that second exclusive right we talked about? That is infringed when these folks have gone out and done this. Because if Dr. Seuss wanted to take his settings and and scenery and you know lyrical cadence to the to the kind of poetic um, you know lyrics in the Dr. Seuss books. If he wanted to set those to the Star Trek world, he could have. That would have been his own derivative work, and now he had lost that market, and so that can cause market harm. <clears throat> well, the Star Trek folks lost. It was not um, transformative, and that case, um, we will wait to see what happens. There's a cert petition that is pending and as it turns out our law firm is involved in the cert petition on behalf of the Star Trek side of that to see if the transformative holding can be changed. There's more Dr. Seuss though, so let's go to the next slide. Um, people seem to love to use Dr. Seuss to create no, new works and this is the case from the Ninth Circuit also. 
of Dr. Seuss versus Penguin books from the late 90s. And here, the defendants, they wrote and illustrated and published a book called The Cat Not in the Hat. And it was a satirical look at the O.J. Simpson double murder trial. And Dr. Seuss Enterprises was not happy again, and they sued, saying, look, you took the image of our cat, um, his hat, the images on the front and back, and you kept repeating them throughout the book, and even though you shoved your own lyrics in there, this sort of satirical thing about O.J. Simpson's murder trial, um, it's not enough. And Penguin asserted fair use, and there you can see some of the lyrics that were in the, the, the Penguin Books version, um, which have nothing to do with the Dr. Seuss original, but they pick up on it a little bit, you know, you know, two victims flail, assault a sale, somebody will go to jail, who will it be, oh me, oh my, right? The same kind of lyrical cadence and even some of the same verbiage that comes, the oh my, oh me, that comes from the Dr. Seuss books. They used it to tell this story about, you know, Johnny Cochran and Deedle Dee, the dream, team need, the dream team needs a victory and that type of thing. And so in any event, that goes to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit said, there was no critical bearing on the substance or style of the cat and hat just because they used the same kind of cadence and style and shoved it into an O.J. Simpson story. They didn't need to use the cat and the hat logos or the cat's pictures to get any attention. They could have just told their O.J. story without any of it. And that was part of the problem. They seemed to be using the cat and the hat's imagery and, and even a couple of the lines in order to trade off the goodwill and value of the cat in the hat to get publicity value for what would otherwise have just been, you know, perhaps just a silly poem about the O.J. Simpson trial. And so the court said there really wasn't a genuine effort at creating a transformative work with new expression. And so as a result, ultimately, what the court held is that there was no parody defense. They just kind of found it was made up and they rejected it. Now, this case, I think, could have gone the other way. And it's certainly a case that's not a slam dunk because um, it was a case that used the cat in the hat as a character for sure, but it was also a, ca a case where there was a substantial sort of parodical use that was made, um, you know, that arguably wasn't that different to what the Two Live Crew was doing in terms of the, the social commentary. And the Two Live Crew was, was held, although it wasn't held fair use as a matter of law, it was held that it could be. And so it was for a jury to, to look at. And so there again, you see some more of the quotes um, that you obviously, if you're familiar with the Dr. Seuss works, you know it's picking up on it a bit, you know, such as the lines, then who, then who, was it him, was it her, was it me, was it ye, was it you, oh me, oh my, oh my, oh me, the murderer is running free. Obviously it's picking up on the cat in the hat, but they were not transformative enough, the Ninth Circuit held, and so there again, Dr. Seuss won. So now we're gonna go from Dr. Seuss to Green Day and concerts. And there you see on our first slide here, the big picture on the left is known as the Scream Icon. And it's, the author is um, a man named Staub, and he created and drew that picture of a, a person in anguish screaming, it's their face. And on the right hand side, you can see a bunch of posters of his picture that were stuck on a wall on Sunset Boulevard in a little alcove. <clears throat> and some of them have been marked over a little bit, it looks like. But in any event, someone came along and took a photograph of that place on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood where Staub's scream icons were posted on the wall, as you can see in that kind of montage. And so what happened in the Green Day case, let's go to our next slide, there you can see the Green Day you know, concert, and you can see in the background of the Green Day concert a video screen. And the video screen had this montage video that was put up um, during the Green Day song called East Jesus Nowhere. And in the video montage, they show a picture of that Sunset Boulevard collage with, which had Staub's um, um, scream icon in it. And they show that picture and there's a red cross that's painted over it. And you can see it there in the lower left-hand corner. And so what happened is, you know, the video that was made for the Green Day concert was depicting this brick alleyway covered in graffiti, there were all these images of, of Jesus that end up getting defaced throughout the course of the video. And throughout the whole video, the center of the frame is dominated by this unchanging scream icon, the, the actual original creation of, of, um, of um, Staub, um, of, the, of the original. And 
what happened is it was modified by adding this large red sort of spray paint cross over it and that was claimed to have been sufficient to justify fair use and so when the author of Scream Icon sues and says you're infringing my copyright by using my picture in your video the court said no that's fair use and so let's look at the analysis what the Ninth Circuit said here is that the use of the photo was transformative it wasn't simply a reproduction because it was put into a video with other elements where the video was about religion and Christianity and the original anguished screaming face had nothing to do with religion it was just an anguished screaming face and so they said fundamentally it was sort of a transformative use of the work in the context of the video and the Red Cross being put over it and then the music that was that the video was kind of um, synced to in terms of the message um, they agreed that the scream icon was creative so got protection um, they on the third factor which is the amount taken I mean it was it wasn't meaningfully divisible the whole thing was taken so that certainly supported the plaintiff author artists creation and the fourth factor the court said I mean it was incidentally commercial I mean the the concert wasn't marketed the video wasn't sold itself per se but it was at a commercial venue where Green Day was obviously earning a lot of money to play their concert and, and, and show that, that work, the video. Um, but nonetheless, fair use was rejected. And here's what's also really important about the case. Not only did the author lose on fair use, which you look at it at first blush and say, you know, that case could have gone the other way. I mean, that was no slam dunk that Green Day was going to win that. In fact, it's a bit of an outlier case. And if you poll most copyright lawyers, they would feel that's a pretty significant taking and use. And in a little while, when you look at some other works here you're going to wonder about the you know the viability of the Green Day case as it lines up against some other cases but nonetheless it was held to be fair use but what was really damaging was the plaintiff the creator of the scream icon also was told he had to pay two hundred thousand dollars to Green Day to pay their attorneys fees because he dared sue them for copyright infringement and that was a significant hit against someone which really damages creators rights to enforce their works obviously if they could have to pay that much money to a large you know you know multi-millionaire rock band um, who outright used the work now luckily the ninth circuit although they found the use was fair use they did reverse the attorney fee award and they said that no he didn't have to pay green day their attorney's fees um, you know it was a good faith argument to make that it was not fair use um, but one of the practice pointers that comes out of this is that it's a massive risk and burden to bear for everyone but if you're a small artist and some big corporation or big wealthy band uses your work you run a risk of trying to even enforce your rights if you could be forced to pay hundreds of thousands in attorney's fees and so that actually at some level chills your ability to protect your work and it may give a more expansive bubble to to fair use or just theft, right, that otherwise wouldn't exist. Now we're going to go to Don Henley's Boys of Summer, and this is the transformative sequel, and here we're going to talk about the line between satire and parody a little bit, and it's a thin, but it's a difficult line, and it can be an expensive one to be on the wrong side of, and this case is a case that my law firm actually litigated on behalf of the defendant, who was a Senate candidate, Chuck DeVore, who was sued by Don Henley when Chuck DeVore made a campaign commercial for his um, U.S. Senate run here in California and he made a video where Chuck DeVore himself sang it and he was a client no, I'm sure he won't take offense he's not a great singer um, it was not a market substitute for, for Boys of Summer in other words it was a rather screechy version of a different song with completely different lyrics and so his idea was that um, you know you know he was talking about you know the absence of hope from the Obama years and it was kind of a play on the boys of summer he felt and so he felt inspired to create this song when he saw a Barack Obama bumper sticker on a Toyota Prius and it made him think of the deadhead stickers that come from the lyrics of Don Henley's boys of summer and so he revised the lyrics of boys of summer to create a song that, re that really just made fun of President Obama of um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and it made fun of Obama's supporters um, Don Henley was not amused and so he sued for copyright infringement and so you can see on the next slide here the on the left we have Don Henley's lyrics to the boys of summer and on the right you can see Chuck DeVore's lyrics called the hope of November and 
so the only difference is the music was identical. Um, so he used all of Don Henley's music, but he just had these completely different lyrics. Um, and they, but they match kind of the, the rhythmic music of Don Henley's. So, you know, Don Henley says, nobody on the road, nobody on the beach, I feel it in the air, the summer's out of reach. He said, Obama overload, Obama overreach, we feel it everywhere, trillions in the breach. So it's the same kind of rhythmic rhyme to go to the music, um, but the lyrics were totally different. So in any event, defendants, Chuck, Chuck DeVore, um, argued that this was fair use, and this was a um, parody that was using a portion of the original work to hold it up to ridicule and to comment and shed light on it. And the question before the district court in this case was, is it a parody because it is making fun of Don Henley or Don Henley's lyrics, or was it really a satirical use where it didn't really criticize the content of the original, but was instead just using someone else's work to make fun of something else, not the original work or even the author, right? And Chuck DeVore was making fun of President Obama, and Nancy Pelosi, and, and the claims of hope and all, all of that that was in the campaign. And so that became this line between parody and satire. And parody can find refuge as fair use, but it needs to poke fun at the original. And if you're not really poking fun at the original and you're just using the original to do something different, it may be satirical, but that falls outside of fair use. And you can think back to some of those Dr. Seuss examples or the Star Trek example where the context and setting was the same and they just changed out you know, the characters and some of the lyrics. So in any event, Fair use was rejected at summary judgment by the district court, and that brought effectively the case to an end. Chuck DeVore lost, and it's a very important line to know what side to be on in terms of the satire parody line. This now brings us to Prince, and we are going to start with Prince the artist, Purple Rain Prince, and the collision with a photograph of Prince and Andy Warhol, and this is a Second Circuit decision that came down in 2021. And so you can see here um, on our pictures on the right, the top picture is a photograph, portrait photograph taken of prints by a photographer, and it was one of a series of photos taken in the 1980s, and then one of them was um, licensed to Vanity Fair to go in a Vanity Fair article, or a Rolling Stone article perhaps it was, just on prints. And so it was you know, one of several photographs taken of prints, and, and you can see the photograph there. At some point after that, Andy Warhol um, took that photo and made some tweaks to it and started selling it as commercial art. And it's sort of, you can see there on the bottom, the versions of Andy Warhol's pop art, for lack, for lack of a better word, or for my lack of a better knowledgeable use of the right word, but pop art, um, his sort of paintings that were sort of done using the photograph with his kind of classic you know, Andy Warhol thing that he does um, um, there in the lower right-hand corner. And so in any event, the author of the photo found out about it, wasn't happy, and sued the Andy Warhol estate um, claiming copyright infringement. And the Andy Warhol estate asserted fair use, and they said, no, I mean, what we've done is transform, change, modify the work. Um, we've made certain changes to it and tweaked it. We've flattened it. We've added all these colors, and we've also created what's you know, collectible pieces of art. It's not just a photograph. And the district court granted summary judgment saying that, that it was a transformative event, what Andy Warhol did to the photograph. And so fair use as a matter of law could attach. That then brings us to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which on March 26, 2021, reversed and said that it was not fair use as a matter of law. So, you know, it wasn't even a question for the jury. They actually said it's unambiguously not fair use. And so here you see what they said is the, the fact that Andy Warhol had a distinct style that was applied to the photograph doesn't itself make something transformative. It's still a derivative work um, that was adapted from the first. And if you want to do that, you need to license it. So, I mean, if, if you want to make Jaws 2 with a whole new movie about like the Jaws thing, you need to license it from Steven Spielberg. You don't just get to transform it and apply your kind of version of movie making to Jaws and say it's transformative. That's sort of what they're saying. Um, and so the modifications, they noted, also really just serve chiefly to magnify some elements of the original and minimize others. 
he cropped it, he flattened it, and you know it was still, though, at the end of the day, in part because it was also a face, it was essentially the same. And the court also noted that there was no market overlap, actually, between the photo portrait for Vanity Fair and the original Warhol art. In other words, the market for a kind of a stock image taken, you know, a portrait type photo taken that's going to be used in a news article or in a Vanity Fair article is a completely different market to the high-end Andy Warhol collector, you know, one-of-a-kind commercial art market. But nonetheless, the court said, the fact that the markets were different doesn't end the fair use analysis. It doesn't let Andy Warhol say that there's no impact on your market. You can still license your photograph to whoever buys photographs. My pop art doesn't infringe that market at all. The court said no, because you could have and should have licensed the work from the, from the photographer in order to create your derivative work. And so you interfered with her right to exploit and monetize derivative works that come from her. And so what the court ultimately held is that there was no fair use as a matter of law. And then the court even went one step further and reached out and actually said that on top of there being no fair use as a matter of law, the court said the two are simply substantially similar as a matter of law also. And so it, infringement exists as a matter of law. The jury isn't even going to get to assess whether the differences Warhol made were enough to make it non-substantially similar. Now, this is a really interesting case. It's provoked a lot of controversy among copyright lawyers and commentators. And you can imagine as you go back to sort of the Green Day case where Green Day was found to have been complete fair use and they even at one point had a fee award for asserting fair use. You, it's hard to square that case with this case. But now let's stay in the Second Circuit and we're going to go to another Prince case from the Second Circuit from a few years earlier, which is hard to even square with this Prince case, which has itself created a whole bunch of copyright controversy. And so now we're going to look at the next slide and it's a different Prince. It's Richard Prince, um, visual artist. But here you see a photograph on the left taken um, by a photographer named Patrick Carew, and it's called Yes Rasta. And on the right, you see Richard Prince's version called Graduation. And it's a photograph, it's the same photograph of the, of the same man, but what he's done is he's made some substantial changes to it. I mean, he, he, the, the background's in a softer focus. He put big lozenges over the eyes so that the subject doesn't really even appear to have eyes anymore, and the mouth. Um, which is part of what Richard Prince did in, his, in these artworks. The subject now is almost anonymous as opposed to the strong individual in the original work. And then he, you know, put this electric guitar pasted onto the canvas in that blue, you know, bright blue color. So it looks like the subject's not even really human, um, whereas the original, it's a decidedly sort of human subject in the natural habitat. And so those changes were the types of changes that then the Second Circuit had to address and decide, could it or could it not be fair use? And what the Second Circuit said in this case, after, you know, the district court had the case first and they said it's not fair use as a matter of law, but the Second Circuit actually on this one said, well, maybe it is. Um, and so what the Second Circuit said is, it could be fair use. Um, and so, you know, he added that guitar and covered up the eyes a bit and changed the background focus a bit. That may or may not be fair use. A jury needs to figure it out. And so it was sent back to go to trial. And so you can see immediately now, these two Prince cases have, are very hard to reconcile within this, the Second Circuit. The more recent one involving Prince, the artist's photograph, they went to great lengths in the opinion to try to say, no, 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 we're not, we're not you know, ignoring that first Prince case, the Richard Prince one, but it's very hard to reconcile the two given the changes being made to one which were held to be non-fair use as a matter of law and one which the court said it could be fair use. So from there, let's just run through a few quick examples of some other works to give you some more context about whether something is transformative or not because the key line in fair use is getting to the bottom of whether the, the new work is transformative. The first case is the Monge case and it's at 688 F3rd and here's the quote coming from page 1176 but it dealt with a magazine that had published some photos of a secret wedding of a celebrity. And it simply published the photos. And the celebrities who were frustrated that their secret wedding had been photographed and then published sued for copyright infringement. And the, the magazine publication asserted fair use. And the court said, no, it's not fair use. I mean, you didn't alter anything there at all. Those were simply... Um, photographs of a wedding that you, you know, got a hold of and you shoved them in your magazine. And that doesn't change 
the expression, the meaning, the content, the message of those photographs. I mean, if you want to take the photographs of the celebrity and do something with them that's transformative, you need to do more than just reproduce them into an article that talks about the celebrity's wedding. Um, and so that kind of a use of a photograph, even if you wrap it around some, you know, People Magazine type article that's t doing celebrity talk, you know, so-and-so got married on this day, it was a secret wedding, it was attended by 500 guests, and it, it reads as like news reporting. That doesn't let you then take the photographs of the wedding, shove them in there, and claim fair use. Um, it's not going to be transformative. And, you know, to the extent there is a mark, I mean, if they're secret, that makes it all the more, or, or private photographs, it makes it all the more likely that you're not going to find fair use. But even if they were authorized photographs, they're the types of photographs that the celebrities could license to particular outlets, maybe Vanity Fair, for a lot of money, who would be able to publish them and would pay a lot of money to be the only magazine with the exclusives. And so a direct and distinct market harm is occurring to the commercial market for those photos. The second case here involves Elvis, and this brings us to our Elvis story. And here we have Elvis Presley Enterprises versus Passport Video. It's reported at 349 F3rd 622, and this is coming out of the Ninth Circuit again in 2003. <clears throat> and here what happened is, um, you know, Elvis had made a bunch of television appearances and a, you know, and, and there were a whole bunch of clips with Elvis, and they were played um, it, without any interruption and serving the same intrinsic entertainment value by a defendant's new work that they created. And so it was simply taking a bunch of Elvis clips, stringing them together, and then saying that here's a new work I'm making, it's you know, Elvis performing or appearing live, and you know, the argument was made that it was transformative. Um, and Passport Video, the defendant there, lost to Elvis Presley Enterprises because it was held that it's not transformative. You can't just simply take a bunch of someone else's copyrighted content, string it together, you know, even without much interruption, <clears throat> and you know, serve the same value of serving the commercial master of trying to monetize someone who wants to see Elvis play live, which is exactly what the plaintiff does with its content of Elvis, the, 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 the inheritor, obviously, the entity that owns the rights to the Elvis Presley content. Um, so no, it's not transformative as a matter of law. And the third one we'll now talk about is in the news context, and so you'll remember that sort of, you know, in our beginning discussion about fair use factors, news type commentary on matters is, is given more leeway for fair use findings. And this case then involves LA News Services suing CBS. Um, and again, this is 305 F3rd 924, and this is coming out of the Ninth Circuit again in 2002. And what really happened here is that, um, you know, CBS took nine minutes of footage and just the best nine footage is nine minutes of some arresting footage and just played it. And, you know, LA News Service, well, LANS, the acronym, was unhappy and said, you know, that's our copyrighted content. You don't get just to take nine minutes of the most valuable footage of that event that was being filmed, play it in your news hour or news story and claim fair use because it's wrapped around news. And the Ninth Circuit said, yeah, that's right. I mean, you took the most valuable part of it and it was an extended part of it for nine minutes. It was visually arresting even um, and nothing was added to it. I mean, so it wasn't a snippet of the video which then led to a sort of maybe a panel discussion about what was going on in the video which may have been a fair use of that snippet. It was just really a way to repackage and take some footage someone else had that was really valuable and not pay them a license fee. And so no, that's not a transformative use, even though it occurred within the context of legitimate news reporting. Now the next two we'll get to are examples on the other side of the line where we have transformative use findings. And so the first one is the Billy Graham Archives versus Dor Dorling Kindersey Limited, 448 F3rd 605. This case comes out of the Second Circuit in 2006, and it involves the Grateful Dead. And so what happened is, Someone created a book on the history of the Grateful Dead. I mean, just sort of a narrative history about the Grateful Dead and their history as a rock band, um, the cultural pop events that occurred around the Grateful Dead, and the like. And inside that book that the person wrote, it was their own original content, writing about the Grateful Dead, which they had First Amendment right to do, obviously, to write a book about the Grateful Dead. They used some imagery, some Grateful Dead imagery, some of the Grateful Dead's posters. Um, 
um, in the book. And they were then sued for copyright infringement and they said, no, it's fair use. We were, yes, it's true we took some of those concert posters and reproduced them, um, but we reproduced them as more as, um, you know, historical artifacts to help tell the story of this history, of this developing history of this band. And it wasn't for artistic expression or promotion of the, of the concert posters as items in commerce. It was sort of small reproductions of them. And the court said that's an example of a transformative use because it's being used to comment on, tell a different story, transform and tell this story about the Grateful Dead's um, history without interfering with the market for the original. Finally, we'll look at Blanche versus Coons, 467 F3rd 244, again from the Second Circuit in 2006. And here we had um, a plaintiff's had a fashion photograph of a pair of women's legs, and it was um, you know, just fashion photographer who'd photographed a pair of women's legs. And an artist went and took that photograph and it altered it and tweaked it and incorporated it into a larger work of art. Um, that was sort of a bigger piece of artwork. It was no longer just a photograph of women's legs used to you know, serve some commercial purpose of like selling shoes or pantyhose or whatever, right? Um, the court there said, no, it's an artistic work and it transformed it because it was part of a larger work and that was transformative. This brings us to fan fiction. What is it and is it fair use? And so there you see pictures of fans' depictions of superheroes where they put the superheroes in new settings. Um, maybe they're lovers when they were not lovers in the original, or they change them and put on sort of, you know, like a Jedi robe over a Harry Potter, Potter character and the like. And so the issue of fan fiction is when fans go out and they want to write about existing literary universes or characters and do something completely different with those characters that's never been done by the original, and then publish it. And there's this whole fantastic trove of fan fiction on the internet, much of which is because it's not being sold or made commercially available, a lot of content houses have an uneasy alliance with it, but they leave them alone because they're odes by the fans to the originals. But sometimes fans go too far. And so the first case is Salinger versus Colting, and this is a Second Circuit case, and this was the unauthorized sequel to Catcher in the Rye, and so it was called 60 Years Later, Coming Through the Rye. And it told the story, basically, of what happens to Holden Caulfield decades after the events of the Catcher of the Rye. And it was, you know, the, the, the author of this new work wrote a whole plot and story using his own words, nothing from the original other than the character from the original, and, and the title obviously was taken in part. And so it, it was from the original's universe, it was just set 60 years later. And the court said, just because the original had never created a sequel and had never written a book about what happens to Holden Caulfield 60 years later, doesn't mean you get to. That's not transformative. That's just taking someone's character and creating a derivative work. Now, let's pivot to the next example. This is from the 11th Circuit, and this brings us to the Gone from the Wind. Here, someone wrote a book called The Wind Done Gone, and what they did was they took characters from this semi-fictional universe of Gone with the Wind, and they mixed them up into a completely new story. And basically what happened is the events of Gone with the Wind were now told through the eyes of not Scarlett O'Hara, the, you know, the protagonist and, and, and whatnot, but through one of her enslaved women. And the purpose of this was to shift the narrative perspective from the original, um, which gave this sort of like wonderful view of the South and you know, there wasn't this like brutal view of slavery and the abuse um, of people in the original. It was sort of this kind of romantic story where you know, slaves were just part of it, right? This was a brutal rebuke telling it from the perspective of one of those slaves about how, no, this isn't some sort of noble, wonderful love story. Um, you know, our perspective is completely different. And so it's a completely different purpose, even though it, the characters were the same and it was done in the same kind of fictional universe, so to speak. That was held to be transformative and fair use. Now, finally, the, the last one is a Star Trek one again, and this brings us to someone who wrote a story about um, the Klingons and some little battle in some like small corner of the Star Trek universe involving the Klingons and a whole story about them. And it came out of some snippet from one of the Star Trek episodes that made reference to this kind of Klingon world and what was going on and nothing ever was done with it and so these people decided to go do something with it. And that's more like the Catcher in, in, in the Rye example in that they were using existing elements from Star Trek, kind of the universe, the Federation, the Klingons, and they were simply now just telling a cool story in that universe without transforming. 
if they'd wanted to transform, perhaps they should have done something completely different, turning the whole Star Trek um, motif on its head, right? Doing something like the example of Gone with the Wind we just talked about. So, practical tips for you advising clients. It's in the eye of the beholder. Fair use, I know it when I see it, right? That's the problem with the test. It's very, very thorny. It's very, very factual. Courts come down all over the place. We've seen opinions that are hard to reconcile between the Ninth and the Second Circuits, and then even within the Second Circuit, you can't reconcile the opinions. And so what this means for you as a lawyer advising clients is that it is very hard to ever tell a client that yes, you're okay, use that work, it's fair use as a matter of law. Those types of letters are very, very hard to give. Um, the transformative question is difficult. This means, of course, there's a massive litigation risk for litigating, and we saw it in Green Day where you could even get hit with fees. And so what this means for you when you're advising clients who want to create new works coming out of existing universes or borrowing is that you can approach this in different ways. You can reach out to the rights holder to try to get clearance. Andy Warhol you know, could have gone to the owner of that photograph to get a license and probably could have gotten it really cheap. Um, or alternatively, go seek a narrow license of some kind. Or if you do feel really bold about trying for fair use, and spend a lot of time looking in the different jurisdictions to find the right jurisdiction to go into because you may want to reach out to seek clearance and when you're denied, trigger a fair use declaratory relief claim in a very favorable jurisdiction. And that's a complex litigation analysis that has to be made. Now, this brings us to the end of the program and it's the U2 moment you've all been waiting for. You're going to get to vote. And so what we're going to look at here is a Raymond Carver super, super short story called The Suspenders. And here you see the final lines from his short story. And the final line is here. For Christ's sake, go to bed over there, somebody yelled. Knock it off. And we did. We turned out the lights, we got into our beds, and we became quiet. The quiet that comes to a house where nobody can sleep. So if you Google Raymond Carver Suspenders short story, you can read it. It's only a few paragraphs long. And it's a really fantastic story about a boy who has to wear suspenders to school, he doesn't want to, he's then fighting with his mom, he has an alcoholic dad that starts yelling at him to be quiet, he gives soapy water to the dad, this makes the dad yell more, and they're all fighting. And then a neighbor yells to them, you know, banging on the door as you saw there, be quiet, be quiet, and they become quiet. But it's a quiet that comes to a house where nobody can sleep. This is sort of an angry quiet that's not peaceful and it's filled with resent. And that last sentence is so powerful in the short story, you can feel the resent. Right? Well, now let's go to U2. U2's song, Ultraviolet, Light My Way. Um, they include the line, there's a silence that comes to a house where no one can sleep. And you can listen to the song or you can um, go read the lyrics to the song if you're not familiar with it. But the basic idea in, in Ultraviolet, in U2's song, is that it's a song about love and dependency. And Bono has admitted publicly that that line came from the Raymond Carver short story. He really liked the Raymond Carver story, and the line stuck with him. It's a powerful line. And so he wrote this song, Ultraviolet, that's about love and dependency, and you know, it's not about resentment or anger, and it's more about sort of a lost love provoking sadness, and that's the silence that comes to a house where no one can sleep. And so his concept is, is, is different. And so the question now you have to answer is, is Bono's use, is U2's use a fair use or is it not? And you need to look through and think about the cases we've talked about today and ask your quest, quest, yourself, you know, is it a, does it serve a transformative purpose? Was the character of it changing? Is it doing something different? Um, is it taking, it's the last line, it's probably the most important line, but is it being divorced and altered from the original in a way that's transformative? Or is it just taking the heart of it and just putting it in a new setting with something else so that it's not? Um, you know, how much was taken? We have that amount substantiality question. Is there an effect on the market for Raymond Carver's short story if Bono does this? Those are the questions that are in your mind. And so what I want you to do is go to onellp.com forward slash fair use. And I've put up the hypothetical there for you. You now get to go vote and you get to see how everyone else who's ever taken this class and thought about the U2 question has voted. And you can figure out where you line up compared to the population of viewers thinking about fair use questions on whether it's a fair use or whether our friends at U2 are and have an infringement problem. You vote, you're the judge, see if you're in the majority or the dissent. Thank you for your attention today. Good day.